Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Raven, and our guest today is Kristen Neff. She is the author of the books, first off, Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself, and the 2021 follow-up book, Fierce Self-Compassion, How Women Can Harness Kindness to Speak Up, Claim Their Power, and Thrive. So Kristen received her doctorate from the University of California at Berkeley, and is currently and has been an assist associate professor of educational psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. So while doing her postdoc work, um, she decided to conduct research on self-compassion, an important topic and, and theme for uh, the podcast here. It's a central construct in Buddhist philosophy and one that had not yet been examined empirically. So you can learn more about Kristen and her work. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes. Self hyphen compassion.org. And uh, Kristen was also mentioned um, very uh, glowing words by Daniel Pink in episode 137, um, author of The Power of Regret. So with all that, Kristen, thank you for joining us here. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well today. Thanks for having me, Mark. Well, Dan mentioned your work and, um, you know, so it, 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 I, I, it, it prompted me to dig deeper and I was reading, you know, your, your thoughts and your work and, and, and I thought this was going to be really helpful for the podcast listeners. Selfishly, it's going to be helpful for me personally. This is something I can work on here. I'm going to try to be compassionate about me stumbling over the word associate. That's just my my most <laughs> recent, most public mistake, but there we go. <laughs> so before, uh, Kristen, you know, I want to tap into your expertise and experience uh, around self-compassion. We're, we're going to do, as we always do here, the the, the key question at hand, um, you know, thinking back to your work and your career, what would you say is your favorite mistake? Uh, well, there are many, too many to um, <laughs> recall. But uh, so one mistake I made, which actually ended up being, I learned from it was a positive, was um, it wasn't that long ago, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, a dissertation student and one of the members of her, and her committee was a, a new associate um, assistant professor who was a I thought unduly critical of my dissertation student's proposal and was kind of not really in line with the department standard. She was being, uh -huh. I, th I thought, too stringent. Uh -huh. And she didn't pass my dissertation student. Uh -huh. And so afterward, we were having a meeting with my dissertation student and this new assistant professor. And I was pretty passionate about saying how I thought, you know, actually that it, it you know, there were some mistakes that maybe needed to be rectified, but I really thought that maybe she was demanding too much. Mm -hmm. And then I get a um, email from the department chair saying, Kristen, would you mind coming in with me and speak, speaking to me to him for a moment? And apparently everyone in the hall could hear me talking to her. I didn't realize wow. I was being so passionate that my voice was caring. And I think I was a little more passionate that I had intended, especially for a new assistant professor. Yeah. So in other words, I got a little carried away in defense of my student. I, I was really kind of mama bear. <laughs> yeah. And so the very next day we had our, our little department meeting. It's actually the area of our department. And I went in and the first thing I said was, I am so sorry. I gave a really public apology to her I said, I'm so sorry. I, I know um, position of power. I really shouldn't have raised my voice. I'm sorry if I scared you. If anyone in the hall, any students, anyone here felt at all uncomfortable, I really apologize. Um, mea culpa. I got too passionate and kind of protected over my student. Please forgive me. Uh -huh. And everyone will look. It was like, whoa. Like they aren't used to someone being so outwardly apologetic uh -huh. um, and it actually turned out that afterward first of all I think it let the assistant professor off the hook because if someone with more senior could make such a mistake and apologize well that gave her permission to make mistakes and apologize uh -huh. yeah. I think everyone was kind of you know because everyone's done it right everyone's had those moments where you get a little too heated a little too passionate and maybe you're a little intimidating to people and so we ended up having actually a really nice discussion mm -hmm. on the role of even anger mm -hmm. at, at work on what happens when we feel really strongly about things and so in other words it was a mistake but it turned out to be um, a learning experience and it's mm -hmm. also kind of linked to my, my book fear self-compassion because I was being I wasn't being so much self-compassionate, but I was being protective. So thy fierceness mm -hmm. was in protection of my dissertation student. Yeah. But sometimes fierceness can um, 
if it's not combined with enough tenderness, if it's not balanced, it can mm-hmm. come off as scary or aggressive if people don't really know what you're coming from. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of, it was the, at that time when I was also working on that book and it was a really good story for that. Um, mm-hmm. And anyway, so that's just one of the, one of the examples of if you make a mistake in, a, I find in a workplace comp- context and you apologize for it in a way that's very inclusive and that's humble mm-hmm. and that kind of says, Hey, this happened. Um, please forgive me. But you do it with, not with your head held in shame, but kind of like, I'm a human being. I make mistakes. Sure. You know, then, then it actually can give other people permission to be human as well. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Well, for uh, lots, lots of um, great points there. One, I, I think it's, uh, you know, when you think about hierarchy and organizations, like many guests yes. here on the podcast have um, talked about leading by example. And when leaders admit a mistake. Yes. That has positive effects on, on everybody else. Right. Right. Yeah. And and it's, it was also a good learning for me because I don't think of myself as someone with power. I think actually I probably am because I'm fairly well known and, you know, I had a slightly higher rank than her. But that's also a thing like, oh, Kristen, you have to remember compared to other people, you seem like you're someone with power. And I don't think of myself that way. So yeah. that was also a good learning for me that, you know, you, you don't take that into account sometimes when you yeah. should. So yeah. So the mistake of yeah. not taking that into account, the mistake yes. of... And her perception of me be, being so passionate, yeah. taking it as like a frightening thing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. did did the word anger get, can you use that word? Did that get thrown at you by the department chair yeah, well, or by somebody else? Yeah. I mean, I think people, everyone, yeah, people thought I was really angry. I actually wasn't angry. I was very being very protective. Mm -hmm. But so in my book, I talk a lot about the need to balance fierceness with tenderness. Mm -hmm. Because if you're too fierce without some obvious kind of caveats, like, you know, really saying that you understand, I I could, I could have couched it in slightly different language. It could have still been very firm. I actually really did think she got it wrong in the dissertation proposal Mm -hmm. meeting, but I could have couched it in, in ways that made her feel safe and not threatened. That would have been the tender self-compassion. And um, and so anger, I think, does have a place. Actually, my book's about that, but it has to be, it has to be done in a balanced way. Yeah. Uh, it yeah. has to be done in a human way. That's the thing. What happens is in that moment, I will admit it, in that moment, I was thinking of my student as the human one mm. and this assistant professor as maybe not as human as she was really in terms of reactions to things. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, I think anger does have a role, but it needs to be um, couched in humanity and hum- human respect for everyone, including the people mm-hmm. that maybe are on the receiving end yeah. of your boundary. Yeah. Uh, so what, what's an example of how you might have prefaced this feedback to the a professor about being too stringent? Um, right. So so what I probably should have done is, um, first of all, I pro- I sh- <laughs> They call it the sandwich method. I know this, actually. Yeah. I teach this to other teachers, but one forgets it. Well, he just started out by um, acknowledging, you know, really great insights. Um, I know you haven't done, you haven't been on that many dissertation mm-hmm. proposals here. You know, you just love your enthusiasm, <laughs> you know, love, love your care for the topic and your concern for my student getting it right, because it was a proposal for her actual dissertation. Um, you know, and then I could have said, you know, actually, um, given what's normal in this department, she she probably her proposal was at the level normally that I I feel personally that would have been a pass. But of course, there's no way you could know that. I should have made it more a a collaboration in terms of how we can work together to help the student, as opposed to it probably came out more like. Um, <laughs> I've been here a long time, and in my experience, people with the proposal this good would have passed. Yeah. <laughs> it, it came out a little bit more like that, if I'm it, totally it, honest. It, it sounds you know, like it so came across as, well, you're wrong, as, and then that's You're wrong, yes, that's right. You're wrong, I'm right, yeah. um, and I'm not happy about it. Mm. Yeah. Did that, I'm, I'm cringing a little bit, so I'm going to give myself some compassion, right, because right. it's embarrassing to realize that even with all our meditation experience or whatnot, mm-hmm. We especially, especially when we're in that protective mode, mm-hmm. so when we care about, you know, I really like the student. I thought she'd done a great job. Yeah. It just came out too strongly. Yeah. Well, you know, and Kristen, thank you for for being willing to share, you know, a story. I I, I certainly do appreciate 
you know, it takes some vulnerability to 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 share a story like that. And I, I do try to honor and appreciate everybody for being willing to come on here and and and, and tell a story like that. So I I do my best to be compassionate toward <laughs> toward you. my guests. It's okay, you know. Yeah. We all know, and you may teach people. We all make mistakes or, you know, maybe there's, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if through your study and uh, experience, if you have a different view, even just around the word mistake, whether that's drawn from Buddhism or, or other influences. Yes. Well, this is, and then it, one of the things, so unfortunately my self-compassion practice hasn't kept me from making mistakes sure. or even from getting angry, but what it has done is like, immediately I was able to apologize, right? Mm -hmm. The second I realized I had no, I had no discomfort in really publicly saying I made a mistake. I'm so sorry if anyone wants to talk to me about it. And so that's what self-compassion gives you. It, it doesn't prevent you from making mistakes, mm -hmm. unfortunately, but it does make you um, two things. First of all, comfortable admitting your mistake and most important learning from it. Mm -hmm. right? right. So, right. And, and I did unpack it afterwards. What could I have done differently? I actually unpacked it with her, um, with my student. So what, what the, actually there's been a, a fair amount written about self-compassion in Harvard Business Review because mm -hmm. what um, that paper gets is that self-compassion is the key factor that enables you to learn from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. If you're protecting your ego, if you feel, first of all, if you feel a lot of shame and it's just, oh, that was so terrible. I don't even want to think about it. I don't even want to go there. I want to hide. Yeah. Well, then you can't work through it and you can't learn from your mistakes. Right. Or if you don't admit the mistake. So some people may fall into shame. Other people may, oh, it's her fault. Who does she think she is, <laughs> that upstart? You know, yeah. I, was, I, was, I was within my rights to give her a dressing down, right? Yeah. You also don't learn from your mistake. And so in order to learn, and, and you again, I think you're leading me here, is, is it a mistake or is it a learning experience? Mm -hmm. Well, of course it's a learning experience. As long as you're willing to acknowledge it, give yourself understanding mm -hmm. for um, maybe some of the factors that led in to what happened. So that you can also see how, how those factors might play out differently next time. Mm -hmm. What might you do differently in that situation so that you do learn and don't get in that situation again? Right. Um, and so compassion. And by the way, it's called self-compassion, but it's not self-compassion at the expense of other compassion. Mm -hmm. All it really is, is in, including yourself in the circle of compassion. Yeah. Most of us actually are compassionate to others and not to ourselves. So when we're self-compassionate, it means I'm also compassionate for my student. I'm also compassionate for that young you know, assistant professor. I'm compassionate for myself. So it's like 360 degree compassion. Mm -hmm. And when the compassion flows every direction, then it actually allows you to see more clearly and come up with better solutions and hopefully win-win solutions and yeah. help everyone. Yeah. Is, is a part of self-compassion sort of recognizing there's a difference between, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back to maybe something that a, a mistake I've made of, of, of saying, um, I was rude to that person, or I did something rude, or I did something that was perceived as rude, as opposed to saying, I'm a rude person. I'm an awful person. There, there's there's a difference there, right? Yeah, so absolutely. So what you're really pointing to here is what I like to call the difference between self-compassion and self-esteem. Mm. So self-esteem is a global evaluation of worth. You know, I'm a good person. I'm a bad person. I'm a nice person. I'm a rude person. You know, it's kind of what, it's really focus on an evaluation of the, of the self. Compassion is actually, under, it's a type of wisdom. Mm. It's understanding the complex causes and conditions that lead people to act as they do, sometimes in very unhelpful ways. Mm. And it's always aimed at behaviors or situations as opposed to judging people. Mm -hmm. So I can still be a worthy person, even though my behavior, and, and it's true, in that, in that meeting, my behavior wasn't wasn't acceptable. You know, it was a mistake. I should have approached it differently. So just because my behavior wasn't good doesn't mean that I'm not good. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So it's unconditional self-acceptance at the same time that we don't accept our behaviors or our situations. Mm -hmm. Sure. And we can have high self-esteem and maybe anchor it in terms of, well, I, I, I'd like to think I'm a kind, patient person. Therefore, I can distinguish from, oof, that was a bad moment. Why? What, what triggered me? What were some of the factors that led me 
to maybe not be able to contain frustration. Yeah, but it's actually really, it's not so much um, high self-esteem as it is unconditional self-esteem. Mm. Because you can have high self-esteem predicated on the belief that you're a kind person. And then when you act unkindly, and actually I wasn't being kind in that moment, then your self-esteem takes a hit. Mm. Whereas if it's unconditional, my self-worth doesn't come from being a kind person or an unkind mm. person. It comes from being a human being. Right. And therefore, when I have moments that I'm unkind, it doesn't impact my worth. Mm. Just as when I have moments when I am kind, it doesn't impact my worth either. My worth is separate mm. from my behavior. Wow. Yeah. And so the behavior is really, um, you want to behave well so that you don't cause yourself or others suffering. Mm -hmm. But it's not contingent. So if you look at the research, what the research shows is that the sense of worth that comes from self-compassion is much more stable over time. It's there when you succeed and when mm -hmm. you fail. Yeah. You know, it's there no matter if people like you or they don't like you. It's just it's a very stable sense of self-worth where self-esteem can bounce up and down like a ping pong ball, depending on did you have a good day or not? You know? Right. Yeah. 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 Um, one, one other follow up I wanted to ask, you know, you 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 talk um you know, about acknowledging and reflecting and learning and how, how do we find the balance um, between reflecting and dwelling on a mistake or beating ourselves up? Like how, at what point yeah. do you decide to sort of let go and move forward? Right. So um, you might say you, with self-compassion, you don't beat yourself up. You might use constructive criticism. Right. Right. So beating yourself up again is personal. I am bad. I'm a bad person. Constructive criticism is wow, Kristen, when you use that tone of voice, she was scared, your student was scared, you know, it wasn't very effective, it didn't help, right? And mm -hmm. then so really, um, when you've learned the lesson is when you move on. Yeah. When you beat yourself up, it actually ironically prevents you from learning the lesson mm -hmm. when it's just about, oh, I'm such a bad person, I, you know, who am I to call myself a professor, whatever it is, then all that actually prevents you from learning the lesson. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and, and it is, by the way, we like to say the goal of practice is simply to be a compassionate mess. In other words, there is no end game where you're not going to be a mess, or you've going to learn yeah. everything. We've learned it all, and now you don't make mistakes. And you, you you got your shit together. Excuse me for saying that, but you got right. your stuff together, right? Yeah. This, that point never arrives. You'll always be a mess because yeah. you're human. Yeah. But you can be a compassionate mess, which means when you do make a mistake, very quickly, okay. All right, well, can I, I may, maybe need to apologize and need to rectify something. And then it's much easier to move on because it's actually a process as opposed to some goal or end point. Yeah. So when we're reacting um, to a mistake that we've made, whether it, it was behavioral or we just do something wrong in the course of our work, um, can, can you talk about the role of um, you know, soothing ourselves? before reflecting and, and how we might do that. Yeah. So so there there are really two sides of self-compassion. I briefly alluded to it, which I like to call tender and fierce. So one's about acceptance. That's the, that's kind of the warm, soothing quality of compassion. It might be like with a parent with a crying child, you hold your child, they start to calm down. So that's that's the warmth and unconditional acceptance part piece of self-compassion. Uh, it's not only ourselves, but it's also our emotions, right? It's okay, I'm here for you, you're upset, and that's kind of the gentle accepting energy. Um, but as I mentioned, you don't you can accept yourself, but not all the situations you're in or your behaviors. And that's what I call fear self-compassion. And I talk about situations because sometimes, especially in a workplace context, the most self-compassionate thing might be to speak up or to draw a boundary. Maybe a coworker is you know, not doing their fair share and asking too much of you, you might say, you know, that situation is not okay. Or maybe you're in a toxic work environment and you need to make a change in some way. So that's the fear side. That's the action oriented side of self-compassion. And we, so we accept ourselves at the same time that we take whatever actions are needed in the world to, to alleviate our suffering and, and to really flourish. Mm -hmm. uh, and so really um, it kind of comes back to you and you can do them simultaneously you can take action in the world at the same time that you're soothing and accepting yourself but if it's just about soothing and accepting yourself and not taking needed action that's not compassionate like mm -hmm. a parent you may still love your child if they aren't potty trained at age four 
but you aren't really being compassionate to your kid because your kid needs to learn how to use the toilet, right? Right. So you can love your kid at the same time. You say, no, no, you need to learn this skill, even if it's difficult or challenging or uncomfortable. So as you know, people are learning, myself included, learning about self-compassion, trying to practice self-compassion. Um, one thing you've written about are, are some of the mistakes we might make in our understanding or our practice of self-compassion. Like what, what are a couple yes. of common ones and what, what Yeah. Kind of well, so actually there? the biggest one is related to what we've just talked about. The the biggest barrier to self-compassion is people think it's going to undermine their motivation, that it's going to mm. make them complacent. Um, it's actually just the opposite. Because when you have compassion for your failures or your setbacks, it makes you more able to learn from them. Mm -hmm. um, if you shame yourself for your fail failures or setbacks, first of all it creates anxiety. And performance anxiety um, often makes it harder for you to achieve, like especially, for instance, we taught self-compassion to high-level athletes, called NCAA athletes, mm. and their performance improved, right? Because when you're less anxious about making mistakes, you, you can be more, you know, at the top of your game, you're more easy to get into flow. You don't, um, you ma maintain your sense of self-confidence because just because I blew the shot doesn't mean I'm a bad player, things like that. So um, that, that's, that's a mistake about self-compassion. It actually is a more effective motivator than self. Self-criticism kind of works. Kind of works the way yelling at your kids work. You get compliance. Mm -hmm. yeah. You get these long-term, you know, these negative knock-on side effects. Right. Same thing with ourselves. It's actually more effective to be constructive and helpful. Yeah. Um, another mistake is people think it's selfish, as if, if I'm compassionate to myself, I'm going to be less compassionate to others. It doesn't work that way. It's additive. Mm -hmm. The more compassion you give to yourself, the more resources you have available to give and sustain giving compassion to others. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and just one final mistake, please forgive me, but another right. mistake is confusion with self-pity. Mm -hmm. Self-pity is woe is me. It's mm -hmm. kind of self-focused. Self-compassion isn't self-focused. It's like, this is the human condition. You might say everyone's imperfect. And so it's actually um, creates more connection with others as opposed to being self-focused. It's quite, it's quite different than self-pity. It's, it's kind of woe is the human condition. <laughs> We're all in the same boat. We're all doing the best we can. Yeah. Yeah. The, the one thing I think is, uh, and I don't know how much you're into sports personally, but I've, I've had a few, you know, high-level athletes on the show, you know, people who'd played in the National Football League, the National Hockey League. And, uh -huh. you know, I think, you know, uh, mistakes in the world of sport are often very public, meaning like you yes. know, millions of people yes. see your mistake. And I, you know, I'm just thinking back over the weekend. Um, this is not really a sports question, but we'll bring it back to, you know, compassion. When you see, you know, a player um, drop a punt that could have lost the game for the team, I, I, it's, it's, it's heartwarming to see teammates come up and, and console the player. Yes. And, and you can see some sense of compassion, which you might not expect to see in the middle of a violent game. Right. So I guess, you know, the, the question I wanted to turn back to you in a, a roundabout way, um, is it, what, what, what's the connection, you know, between others being compassionate toward us and our own ability to be self-compassionate. It seems like, like you were saying, it's additive. Yes, yes. Well, certainly it helps. If you had compassionate parents, for instance, as opposed to very critical parents, it's easier to be self-compassionate. If you have compassionate friends or family members, it makes it easier to be compassionate. Although, having said that, sometimes um, people don't let in the compassion of others. If mm. some people are who are really self-critical or have a lot of shame, they either kind of they they kind of uh, reject the compassion of others, or it makes them uncomfortable. For some people, it kind of feels more comfortable to be flat on the floor than if you know to, they can't fall any lower if they're already criticizing themselves. So if someone forgives them, it's almost kind of scary because it might mean that they would like pick themselves up and they could fall down again. There's there's a lot of family dynamics and the psychology that goes into why it's hard for people to be self-compassionate. It's kind of a whole other um, talk. Uh, but the nice thing about self-compassion is that it's not dependent on others. It is right. absolutely, it helps. Um, 
But again, you might reject it even if you do have compassion in others. But if you don't, for some reason, maybe maybe your partner or your friends are busy or they, they, they don't have it in them to give it right now, you can give it to yourself. So it's really ultimately a form of self-reliance. Mm. It's a type of reliance, a type of independence. Um, it's a very powerful form of resilience. Mm-hmm. So just just another story of combat veterans. We found that combat veterans who are more self-compassionate about all the trauma they experienced, they were much less likely to develop PTSD. They were less Mm. likely to turn to alcohol to deal with the pain of the trauma they experienced. They were much stronger and able to get through tough stuff when you have your own back. In other words, it's great if you've got your allies with you, absolutely. But if you're an enemy to yourself, you're undermining your own ability to succeed. But if you're mm-hmm. an ally to yourself, in addition to others, that's mm-hmm. going to make you that much stronger. Mm-hmm. And that, that's 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 powerful, and it goes to show how this you know this is transferable across different domains. You know, um, you you used the word compliance a couple of minutes ago, and I think like that. There are so many leadership behaviors in in different workplaces. I've been subjected to it or victim of it, especially early in my career of, of, um, you know, like you say, you know, it, it, it's effective, uh, these, these behaviors of blaming or yelling or uh, shaming others are effective in creating uh, a really, really poor performance and dysfunctional culture. It seems like the worst thing a leader could do is compound somebody's mistake by getting angry and do, do, does does a leader who I, I I'm, I'm trying to think if there are connections here a leader who struggles with self-compassion is that leader more likely to be uncompassionate toward others when they make a mistake right so so that's the interesting question um they don't necessarily go hand in hand simply no. because there are people who are compassionate to others but not compassionate to themselves mm-hmm. So in research, what we find is um, when people are self-compassionate, they tend to be compassionate to others. But also when people are not self-compassionate, they're often compassionate to others. So the two, most people, they don't, they kind of operate independently. But it's almost never the case that people are self-compassionate and not compassionate to others. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, But what we do know is that people, we do have research showing that people respect self-compassionate leaders more. Mm-hmm. Because again, a self-compassionate leader, instead of you know, you, maybe you make a mistake, and if you just um, say, "Oh, I'm such an idiot," like hoping people won't be mad at you, they don't. People don't respect that. But mm-hmm. if you don't acknowledge it, people don't respect that either. Yeah. So leaders who can self compassion you know, so in other words, like I did, acknowledge my mistake, but I didn't like shame myself. It's like, hey, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, you know, this happened. Um, I'll, I'll do. But you kind of you treat yourself with respect in a human being as you acknowledge your mistake, they know, they found that um, workers respect that more in leaders mm-hmm. than, than leaders who either are not compassionate yeah. or um, really beat themselves up. So, yeah. which, which is less likely to actually happen from your boss beating yourself up publicly, but um, mm-hmm. higher self-compassion is linked to more respect from the people you lead. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm thinking back just one other, if you'll forgive me, one other time back to all, all names here, name names here. It was a game. It was uh, Louisiana State LSU. Okay, player pl- player dropped the punt. It that ended up not being that. It could have lost them the game. It didn't lose them the game. But you know, th- again, there was that compassion on the field. The one thing I noticed after the game, the head coach Brian Kelly was very critical of the player. You'd almost say like throwing him under the bus and made comments like. Well, we put him out there because we thought he had proved him. I'm paraphrasing. We thought uh-huh. we'd, he had proved himself, but we're going to have to reevaluate that. Like, it didn't sound like he was being self compassionate if he thought he was making a coaching mistake. It, it really seemed like just. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, he, he was blaming. See, that's if you don't have, and maybe he, I don't know if he made a coaching mistake or not. I didn't, but, but if he did and he threw the punter under the bus then that's to protect his own self-esteem, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and so the thing is, once a mistake has been made, it's already been made. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So beating yourself up is not going to actually make that mistake go away. It already happened. So if you if right. you drop the punt, it's already happened. So the, the, it's all about what happens in the next moment. 
Right. And what we know is a warm, supportive stance, which by the way, does it acknowledges mistakes. It doesn't sugarcoat it. It's, oh, it wasn't that big a deal. That's not compassionate because this is your career. You need to know exactly what went wrong, how it went wrong, so you can try to improve. It's yeah. always about improving your game. And, um, you know, again, with coaches, a supportive, a warm, supportive coach, maybe a tough coach, but one who is warm and supportive typically gets more out of their players mm -hmm. than a coach who just like belittles the, the players and just, you know, ma right. makes them frightened all the time. Mm -hmm. Then they, they actually don't play their best. So that's actually a really good analogy for what self-compassion looks like. Imagine the ideally tough, but fair, mm -hmm. supportive, um, smart, wise coach. Yeah. That's what self-compassion looks like. Yeah. And, you know, back to a realm that's probably more meaningful and particularly more of a, you know, life and death situations in, in healthcare when mistakes mm. are made. Yes. Um, there's, uh, I mean, people use this phrase, uh, it rhymes, it doesn't make it any more cute, you know, naming, blaming, and shaming. And there, there's, there's punishment, there's firings, there's losing of your license, or even in some cases, criminal conviction. Yeah. Which, um, I mean, we're, we're, we're veering away from self-compassion here, but it seems like that reaction just, you know, com compound, it, it, it makes more mistakes more likely in the future is the, the, the sad thing about that reaction to mistakes. Right. Yeah. We, we do teach doctors, um, you know, self-compassion. We have a whole program for healthcare professionals mm. and it's hard because they are only human beings and people may sue you if you're, hum if you make a mistake as a human being and it's a really tough position to be in. But the option of being a robot is not available to us at this time. Maybe it will be in the future, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it's kind of touching on, there's a distinction between self-compassion and self-forgiveness mm -hmm. or compassion for others and forgiveness. Compassion means you embrace the pain of what's happened. You acknowledge that you're a human being, you're doing the best you can. Um, but forgiveness can't come until you've made the commitment not to make the mistake again. Again, you can't control it, but it's um, complacency saying, oh, well, no big deal. That's not compassionate right. because you might make it again. So really taking very seriously what happened, really committing to doing everything you can not to let it happen again. That's a really essential part of the process. And you really can't move forward without that step of the, of the process. Mm -hmm. Well, our, our guest today, again, has been Kristen Neff. Um, you know, Kristen, um, given us so much to, to think about from, you know, your story and your reflection on it and thinking about mistakes that we might make or mistakes um, we might see people make in our workplace, whether it's, you know, the football field or uh, uh, a more typical workplace. But you know, I, I do want to point people um, to Kristen's website, self-compassion.org. Uh, beyond the books, there's a self-assessment. And I, I went through and completed that self-assessment. That was certainly, you know, food for thought of looking at, you know, self-kindness versus self-judgment and, um, you know, uh, common humanity versus isolation. Um, you know, there's there's food for thought. And I think it's interesting not just to have this overall question of at me asking myself or the listener asking, am I self-compassionate? It seems like there's there's kind of both a spectrum and then there's various degrees. Uh, I wanted That's to ask right. you about the assessment and what we might think of that. Yeah, yeah. So it's about 20 years ago that I made that the self-compassion scale. Now there's well over 4,000 studies that have used it. So um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. As you say, there's different dimensions of self-compassion. There's your ability to be aware of your of your pain. By the way, it's more general than just mistakes. We, we've been talking about the context sure. of mistakes, but for instance, if you think about the combat soldiers, right? Maybe it's not mistakes they made, but just the trauma they experienced. Mm -hmm. Passion in the Latin means suffering, con means with. It's like, how are we uh, with this tough stuff? Whether that's from failure, mistakes, or just life like the pandemic. Um, and so it generalizes, how are you with the tough moments? So we need to be aware of them. Mm -hmm. We need to remember that we aren't alone. It's part of the human experience to make mistakes or to have difficulty. And we need to be warm and supportive to our, toward ourselves, as opposed to just harsh and shaming um, and in order to be uh, well. The research is very, very strongly, um, very strongly shows that more self-compassion leads to better mental health and physical mm -hmm. health. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Because the two are connected, of course. Yeah. Well, it's certainly something I'm going to continue reflecting on. I'm going to try to practice some self-compassion about my short uh, shortcomings isn't the right word, but I said it. Um, shortcomings Your humanness. My, my, be self-compassionate about my humanness. That's yes. a better way of putting that. <laughs> very, Me thank too. You. I, I still cringe when I tell that story, but I'm sure I'm not the only one who's gotten a little too passionate in defense of someone they care about. So yeah. <laughs> well, again, thank you for sharing your reflections on, you know, what, what led to that? What was, what was going on? What were the different factors? And um, like, like you, you, uh, there was another phrase I think you use here, just as we wrap up here, the difference between I failed versus I am a failure. You know, yes. As a, a it's recap. okay to fail. Mm -hmm. um, but we also want to learn from a failure. If, if we're right. complacent, that's actually not carrying to ourselves or others. Yeah. So another recap point here. Um, yeah. yeah, it's not letting ourselves off the hook. It's not carte That's blanche to do no. any reckless thing because, oh, I'll be self-compassionate afterwards. No, it actually leads bad. to the research shows people are more likely to take personal responsibility mm -hmm. because it's safe to. Mm -hmm. And it's helpful. Yeah. And we want to help ourselves if we have self-compassion. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been great. I And, and a final reflection here, um, like sometimes I because these questions aren't all scripted out. So I'm trying to think through of a question on the fly. And it's one thing to ask a kind of meandering roundabout question, but then I think I noticed like I was being self-critical for doing that. That makes the question even more meandering. <laughs> Maybe I should stop doing that. <laughs> uh, is, but, is, that a, is that a statement or is there a question there? That uh, was just a statement of reflection. Okay. So, uh, but again, we've been joined by uh, Kristen Neff. Please do check out her books self-compassion and fierce self-compassion. Yeah, and also just a little plug, we, if, if you want to do the practice, we have something called the self Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook. And it's just, there's like 40 actual practices and exercises mm. you can do to actually train yourself in the skill of self-compassion. Because it is, it's not necessarily um, a natural way to be with itself. It's a habit we have to build. I'm going to go get that right now. Like I said, okay. I'm going to work on that and I'll be kind to myself. So Kristen, thank you for being a guest here today. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks. I've had a lot of fun, Mark. Thank okay. you. Thanks.